Asgard told me before I get on the stage, you're gonna have a surprise, and now I know exactly what he was talking about. So I'd like to thank the organization for inviting NAV Canada to this session. Uh, I'd like to thank you for being here and listening to us. And uh, also, because I'm French-Canadian from Quebec, uh, j'aimerais reconnaître aussi la participation des gens du Québec ici. Alors, uh, bonjour à mes collègues du Québec. So on that note, I'd like to talk uh, a bit about uh, NAV Canada and then go into the initiatives that we've been working on in the last couple of years uh, that I believe, and we do believe very strongly, will reshape the way that we do business worldwide when it comes to uh, following aircraft and uh, air traffic control services. But for the scientists in this room and the researcher, I want you to take a look at this in a sense that in the very near future, each of these aircrafts flying in the sky will become flying sensors with on tremendous amount of data that you can tap in to look at how the planet is behaving in the future. So keep that in mind while I'm doing the presentation. So the overview, uh, my intention is to talk about uh, what we are, the polar statistic, uh, uh, traffic statistics. I'll have a little, little short video on the initiative, so I'll take a break at that time, it's about two minutes, and then we'll come back with the uh, other discussion where we go with space-based ADSB. So, I'm just looking at the slide myself. I'm not, not sure where I was looking. I got it. So NAF Canada is a not-for-profit not organization. Basically, the revenues that we make, uh, we have to have uh, a system in place where we pay the dividends to our customers, and the customers are the airline companies, uh, the general flying public, uh, uh, general aviation industry. Uh, NAV Canada is uh, on a yearly basis uh, bringing revenue in the range of $1.3 billion. Uh, any additional revenues to that through the sale of technologies return back as dividend to our customers by maintaining our fee structure the way it is or lowering the fee structure. So we don't have any shareholder. Um, we are responsible for uh, the second largest ANSP in the world. We have uh, more than 12 million aircraft movement that we handle. It's a huge country, as you will see in the, uh, the balance of the presentation. And we are regulated by the Canadian government when it comes to safety. We're not regulated by the Canadian government when it comes to financial performance. It's strictly under the safety umbrella. The people, uh, we have 4,600 people in the organization, uh, air traffic services, flight service specialists, weather specialists, uh, technician, engineer, uh, and the engineering group uh, has done a lot of support in the initiative I'm gonna show to you later on. Um, the mission statement, uh, you can read as much as uh, I, I can talk about it, but. Bottom line is that we're in the business of providing safety. We're selling safety. We're making sure that aircraft fly within the Canadian airspace and the delegated airspace over the North Atlantic uh, in a safe uh, fashion. The corporate objective, uh, I'm not going to go through the six of them, but what I want you to pay attention is number six. And number six is really uh, a corporate objective that was approved by our board of director and is making his way all the way down to the operational employees. So all the corporate executive have very specific goals and objectives when it comes to the number six, which is a reduction of greenhouse gas emission. And, and this company, our company is taking this very seriously. So any initiative that we can undertake to uh, meet this particular objective are being uh, taken extremely seriously by the corporation. I'll go, again, not to expand too much time on it because I really want to focus on the initiative we're working on, but just to glance uh, rapidly, the number of facilities we have across Canada, we have seven area control center. These are the radar room that you don't see. Uh, they're idled somewhere in the cities, seven cities across Canada. Uh, but they're taking care of all the airspace and all the aircraft flying uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Canadian airspace. 
You have 41 air traffic control tower. That's probably the, the reference that the public is looking when they're looking at air traffic control is a tower reference. So we have 41 of these. We have 55 flight service stations across uh, Canada. These people are providing flight information and weather information to pilots, but they don't have the authority to clear aircraft to land or depart, depart or separate. So it's a different trade. Uh, we have eight flight information center, which basically uh, capture the, the weather environment and provide that information to the pilot in transit. And 51 community aerodrome radio station, uh, and we have many of these in the north of Canada. 33 maintenance center, technicians. And then you see how big the airspace we are accountable for. It's huge airspace, and I'll show you uh, part of that uh, airspace where the area are being now covered today for surveillance uh, capability using ground infrastructure like radar and ground ADSB station. Technology, since the creation of NAV Canada, we bought from the government of Canada in 1996 at the cost of 1.5 billion. We have since invested in the technology, uh, two billion dollar, and the investment are paying off in a sense that we're selling our technology worldwide now. Now, the polar flight. Uh, this graph depicts for you, within Canadian airspace, the increase in traffic movement using the cross-polar routes. So as you can see, on an annual basis, this is continuously increasing. Uh, and this year, this slide was taken uh, about a month and a half ago, and this year, we believe that we will uh, probably reach the 15,000 plus uh, crossing into the polar traffic. This diagram, you saw it from Asger's slide as well, but this diagram shows uh, from Europe to uh, Canada as well as from uh, Canada to the Asian Pacific area, the trajectory of the aircraft. The larger blue line in this graph is showing the jet stream. So aircraft flying eastbound want to get on the jet stream, and aircraft flying westbound want to avoid the jet stream because these are very strong wind in a range of 200, 250 knots. So that's pretty fast wind. Now, the evolution within the Canadian airspace of the surveying capability uh, was quite slow in progress over the years until uh, NAV Canada came in and started looking at different initiatives to buy the right infrastructure to provide our people the right tools to provide uh, better services to the airline industry. So this is a radar, typical radar. Uh, I was talking with uh, some of the fellows uh, in the Nunavut region. The first radar that we installed in the northern region was in the Iqaluit. Uh, way back, and uh, one of the comments we received when we installed the, the radar in Iqaluit, I want to share this little anecdote with you, is that the main requirement from the Inuit people there was they wanted to have a light on top of the dome. And, and there was a very valid reason to that, because I was very surprised to hear why they were insisting, and it was for direction purposes, because the, the, the chief of the band I was talking to at the time told me, he said, Larry, if you put a light on top of that radar, you allow my people to navigate toward something if they're lost in the north. And that was pretty impressive. We did put the light on top of the radar dome. ADSB. So you've heard about ADSB, uh, maybe a bit, but ADSB stands for Automatic Dependence Surveillance Broadcasting. So within the ADSB signal that the aircraft is sending down to these ground stations, there's more than 50 different fields embedded in that message about temperature, icing condition, wake dissipation, speed, trajectory of the aircraft, intended trajectory. So there's numerous data in there that we are not fully using today. Um, and the North Water uh, Warning System, in, uh, again, uh, working with the Department of National Defense, we have expanded our radar uh, capability as well, installing uh, additional ADSB station on the ground. 
So I'll go quickly. So 1996, Canada, this is the radar uh, surveillance capability that exists at the time. 2004, we expanded these using ADSB or ground infrastructure uh, that were already existing with the military, and we tapped into the signal. And then we introduced over the Hudson Bay area the ADSB uh, capability. And that allowed aircraft to transit in that airspace with less separation between them, saving a lot of fuels, and giving the controllers more capability to assist the flight. And then South of Greenland, we will be connecting very soon with our colleague in Iceland. And, but despite all these efforts, we never covered the real northern airspace of Canada or the Ar Arctic area where we still have some accountability when it comes to air traffic services. So what are we going to do about this? We're going to extend the coverage. Right now, a flight, and a very soon from Europe coming to Canada, can transit with about 3,000 kilometers under ADSB coverage. In a very near future, with a colleague in Iceland, we're going to expand that coverage. But very shortly after that, we have embarked into an initiative with the Iridium communication of the United States. They were launching their new generation satellite to replace their, their current constellation. And when they started talking about this, they came to NAV Canada because they've had, they had heard how we were investing in technology, how we were improving, how we were selling our techno technology worldwide, and they asked NAV Canada whether or not there was a need or, 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 or there was anything that they were doing that we could participate in. And our Canadian engineer worked on developing a box that we could put on the satellite using about 10% of the payload of the Iridium satellite in order to survey worldwide the aircraft using ADSB information. So that's where the idea started. Um, right now we're completing about 52 of these boxes. There are seven satellites being assembled by Thales in Toulouse, France. And what was being known as a project two, three years ago, and a lot of skeptical people, is now becoming a reality. And it's, it's, it's pretty exciting from an Afghan Canada perspective, but it is also very exciting from a world aviation perspective. So the video will play for about two minutes. I'll take a short break, and I'll come back right after that. So, so that's the global surveillance. It shows you the capability, and then we should go to the video. Technology is once again revolutionizing the world of aviation. Since the Second World War, radar has been the primary method to monitor aircraft movements beyond the line of sight, and it remains so until today. In recent years, ADSB has become a widely accepted alternative for air traffic surveillance, providing critical information to controllers and pilots. Current ADSB and radar systems are limited to land-based areas, leaving vital airways over 90% of the world uncovered by any real-time surveillance resulting in inflexible and inefficient routing over much of the world's airspace. These global blind spots will soon disappear. As early as 2017, ADSB receivers on 66 cross-linked satellites will relay signals from all ADSB-equipped commercial aircraft through the Arion ground facility to air traffic controllers worldwide. Arion will extend ADSB capabilities to provide accurate, real-time visibility of ADSB-equipped aircraft in any flight information region, including current procedural oceanic, polar, desert, and mountainous airspace. Space-based ADSB will enable the optimization of flight paths and altitudes, increasing operational and fuel efficiency for airlines. Arion will increase ATM efficiency and capacity, as well as enhance aviation safety, all while lowering infrastructure cost for ATC providers. The system will leverage existing investment in ADSB technology and helps ANSPs, airlines, and regulators meet future global infrastructure demands. Arion, transforming the way you see the sky. Thank you. 
So this is the constellation, and the reason why we wanted to show you the constellation, the way, the, the behavior of the constellation, is to clearly indicate, as you're looking at this uh, picture, clearly indicates the area where the multiple uh, redundancy will be at the polar level. These are low Earth orbit satellite, so you can see that each of the poles will be not only cover, but will be double, double triple, and quadruple cover, uh, coverage, surveillance coverage. So that, in effect, will not only facilitate the opening of additional routes uh, in the polar cro crossing activities, but also guarantee uh, that at any point in time we can follow these aircraft continuously. So there's 66 satellites being launched, six as a backup capability for a total of 72, and we have nine on the ground that will be ready to be deployed, uh, depending on if we lose any of these satellites uh, going forward. So uh, pretty robust environment. Uh, right now, uh, the next uh, uh, satellite launch, because there was some experimental launch, but the next uh, satellite launch will be within the next three to four months and we're anxiously waiting to get the first signal of the ADSB back to Earth and back to some of the uh, equipment for us to have validation on the assumption. But we, we feel pretty confident. Uh, the update rate information that we have received based on the latest validation exercise was we can have an update rate of the aircraft position within less than eight seconds. And there's even some discussion right now that we can reach a performance of three to four seconds. So that being said, you can only picture now and imagine what the rest of the world can do with that type of information. In addition to that, uh, we have announced through the Arion uh, company that we will allow uh, and we will provide alerting services to any aircraft which will be ADSB equipped in the world uh, free of charge. So if there's uh, any aircraft in distress, uh, we will provide support to that aircraft. And in the airline industry have been really uh, open and appreciative of the initiative. But we have to have the satellites airborne. And that's what we're working on right now. So the polar benefits, obviously the accessibility, uh, operational opportunities, the safety, there's no doubt, no question about that one. Uh, improve of uh, flight emergency and the environmental footprint. If we can reduce, and you heard it from Asger, if we can reduce by having uh, reduced separation, by having shorter distance for the aircraft in the world to fly and save as much as two to three hours per flight, you can imagine the impact on the greenhouse gas emission. And this is uh, the a document that is produced by NAV Canada. It's called CIFR, and it stands for Canadian Initiative for Fuel Emission Reduction. And we report on an annual basis on our, uh, our uh, initiative on it, and we are projecting uh, uh, some significant saving in the, in the range of 21 million metric tons of uh, CO2 emission. So that concludes my presentation. <laughs>